to the Doctor Who Marathon. I'm your host, Vida, and today we're going to be talking about the canine episode, Robot Gladiators, written by Jim Noble, which is his last story for the series, and is directed by James Bogle. Um, this story is a kind of riff on the TV series uh, Robot Wars, in which you get two robots to fight each other. It was a big popular TV show back in the... Uh, late 90s and early 2000s, something that I grew up on. Um, it's also a kind of a riff on the idea of, like, cockfighting, I suppose, where you get illegal uh, creatures, in this case robots, um, to fight it off in an arena-like um, thing. I guess, in a way, it's kind of like Fight Club as well, which is odd because they will not be the only Doctor Who story that tackles the concept of Fight Club with the Torchwood episode, Combat. Um, that episode is also inspired, heavily inspired by Fight Club, so why is this another thing that happens? Um, but I want to say right at the bat, um, usually one of K-9's biggest issues as a series is its formulaic, um, basic approach in its storytelling and the way it feels. In terms of the visual style of this story, this story does actually have a very unique visual stamp. In fact, when we kick off the, the episode, um, it's like we've completely jumped into a completely different series. Um, we get introduced to this character, Freddy, M uh, Freddy the Entertainer Maxwell. He's played by Gareth Harris and um, He's basically this ringleader who um, he has this black market for robots that, uh, that he competes in this illegal game of robot gladiators. And he has harnessed the technology to essentially give his machines sentience, or at least that's what he tells uh, his customers and all that. We actually see him get an interview by someone who wants to enter in the, who wants to have their product, their, their uh, someone who wants to like uh, help out in the business. Uh, and it turns out this person is actually uh, Darius, who claims that um, he used to work with Griffith, uh, Griffin, but however, uh, he betrayed him, he, uh, they got off on the wrong foot, and uh, now he wants to work with Maxwell. Um, and he also has a gift, a sort of uh, contender, for the for the games and uh, what he has is k9 who he claims that maxwell can uh, uh freddy the Ma entertainer maxwell could have him as one of his gladiators we all then cut um back uh, uh a few hours earlier and um, for some reason this story has this really weird um title cards for stuff like um showing the time and location it has this really um cartoonish uh, appeal to it um it's like a green text with this like golden outline it reminds me a lot of like uh really you know a lot of kids uh, programs and that's what this kind of episode is trying to represent it's trying to parody um the over performance of this kind of television uh, this kind of entertainment and in that case it does itself a pretty decent job um it's just occurred to me that this story is essentially Thor Ragnarok before Thor Ragnarok. Because K9 gets turned into a gladiator and he makes friends beyond uh, among the way. Huh. That's a very good yes. <laughs> this is this is Thor Ragnarok of the Doctor Who universe. It's as goofy as it. Um uh, Gareth Harris um who plays Maxwell does this over the top performance he is cartoonish as hell he's got this 1950s voice going on you know um hey, I'm a I'm a street lot Craig you know Krugen <laughs> I don't know what that was he doesn't talk like that but um you get the you get the impression and also as well when um he's announcing to the audience about a fight that's about to begin he almost mimics the uh, announcer from uh, WWE, the wrestling, you know, are you ready to rumble? You know, that kind of stuff. Um, uh, that kind of 
overperformance uh, gets played up. And essentially we get like this flashback then and we essentially learn what has been happening. Uh, essentially Griffith has tracked down this, this man that he used to work with in conjunction with this technology that Griffiths had that basically heightened the intelligence of any robot to and it's to the descent which they are AI they are artificial but real intelligence similar to what of K9 which K9 is kind of like uh, I don't understand you consider this as a miracle but yet they are, um, I consider this just like you know the most basic of basic technologies as Griffith also points out that um, that uh, canines from the future and his technology is highly advanced to Griffiths. It was amazing, groundbreaking at the time. However, Maxwell has taken his technology, taken it underground, and he's used it and is used to basically harm and torture robots um, all over um, the departments uh, ruled London or the UK, wherever they are. I don't know actually. I believe they're in London. Um, so. We, we have this story which is actually really tightly focused because all of our characters uh, here are on the same mission. They're here to take down Maxwell by finding out his, his, um, his tax and some evidence of his uh, ringleading and basically take him down. And uh, they basically, um, our crew of Darius, Stark and Georgie have to pretend to be um, workers, uh, Darius being this shifty uh, dealer, uh, Georgie becomes like a tax, a tax uh, woman and Starky pretends to be an engineer to help K9 when K9 gets thrown into the pits and um, you have this like set of arena and their roles are mainly to the sideline as the main story, the main narrative is K9 uh, befriending these two robot clowns, which um, which they have no purpose of being there. They are essentially just clowns, just entertainers. However, Maxwell found them, took them, stole them, and turned them into, forced them into being gladiators, um, as well as uh, being introduced to another robot who is um, basically a Robocop, but he's highly advanced and he has uh, gained this aggression and, and that's kind of um, part of the plot. Um, and King Nine kind of befriends these clowns. Now, why the story absolutely fails is that the heart of the story, the, the, the meat on the bone, shall we say, is the friendship between K9 and these clowns. For K9's point of view, it does kind of work. You know, you you see K9 uh, kind of have a, not really a friendship, but a sympathy for these clowns. And um, uh, when one of the clowns gets uh, sent to uh, the arena and gets quickly killed by the, the Robocop um, gladiator, K9 is on the first for blood. He's burnt. He's so vengeful, he wants to get in the ring so he can take down and get revenge for his friend. Where the story fails is that the clans are so unavoidably annoying as hell. They are so... Ah, oh, the, the voices just go right through my ears. Every bit of dialogue is like a cat scratching a board. It is horrible. Um, the actors who play the clowns in this, I don't know if it's the same people doing the voices. I presume not, but the clowns, um, they're clearly just clown costumes uh, with the actors in them doing robotic movements to the sound of robotic, you know, sounds like, you know, that kind of stuff. And it, you do kind of, it is kind of distracting at first, but you do get used to it. You do get that, um, that classic who cheap feel to it, and you kind of dig it later on of, of that, um, that aesthetic. But the characters themselves and the voice they're given and the, the personalities that they have, I just wanted them to die. <laughs> I was like, I honestly couldn't give a damn. 
if they didn't bring him back in the end, let them rest in goddamn peace. They are, oh, they were the worst. They were absolutely um, the worst. But what I do really like about this story is its visual style. Because unlike most stories, this story actually takes place majority in um, in the upper half of this of this um, underground arena where it's basically uh, Maxwell's office and the majority of the scenes is basically Darius um, trying to extort information from him and how he you know keeps his business how he stays away from the cops and all that um, and and the other the side of the is the underground bit the bit where you know you got the pits you got the the arena and it has this like dirty gritty look to it. It does kind of fail in the world building because apparently in the arena there's supposed to be audience members watching it, viewing it. However, we never get a visual stimulus. That doesn't make that, no, that's not the right word. A visual cue as if there's audience there. For all we know as an audience viewer, Freddie Maxwell could just be goddamn crazy and is doing it this all purely on his own own um enjoyment his own amusement with um no real viewers no real audience for these games except for him he's just a complete loony uh, that's one interpretation of it because the story does a poor job at establishing this underground um uh, fighting arena uh, but it does mean that the episode does have a new visual look to it it has this kind of 1950s style, especially when you've got Maxwell um, with that accent and he's got the suit. Um, Starkey, uh, not Starkey, Georgie and Darius start wearing suits as well, which kind of gives this upper class um, look. And it's, the, the, the camera's got this grey filter on it, uh, which gives the, the appearance of a 1950s um, Hollywood era movie kind of um, aesthetic to it so on that regard it does look really good um, there's then a massive twist well I say a massive twist there's a bit of a twist where it turns out that Maxwell is actually working for Thorne um, who has actually set up a trap he's actually planned Darius to uh, they basically planned um, no, sorry. Let me let me backtrack. Um, essentially, uh, Maxwell realised the importance of K9 and Darius. He contacted the department. Thorne realised who these people were and basically told him to play along with it to the point where K9 gets thrown into the arena. The crew find Maxwell's uh, data chip where he keeps all of his illegal records. Um, they find it underneath his staff of peanuts, which is kind of this um, this thing for his character. He really loves uh, peanuts. Uh, it turns out he was hiding uh, his card underneath the, the plate, which he offers the peanuts to. Um, which is actually kind of cool looking back, because uh, there's a scene in which uh, Darius is asking him, like, um, where does he keep his information? And he's like, um, keep it small and keep it portable. Um, and then when he asks, like, where exactly, uh, Maxwell's like, ah, that's my prerogative, that's for another lesson. Anyway, Peanuts, it kind of tells you there where he's hidden it, but it's in, it's in plain sight, and that's a great, uh, little story metaphor. Um, but Thorne actually is kind of clever on this, and he essentially gets all the recordings, he gets K9 to fight this, um, this robot which um, Thorne actually put in um, this gladiator is actually filled with dynamite which would uh, destroy the K9 unit because he wants to see K9's re regenerative abilities he knows about K9's regenerating technology which was uh, established on in the first episode of the series, um, Regeneration. 
which all of our characters are completely shocked, and we as an audience are shocked, because for all of us we know, K-9 um, was only seen regenerated in this capacity in front of our main characters. So what's going on? It is kind of strange how none of our characters even thought that maybe one of them told him, or they you know, there's a traitor among the mist, or maybe they're bugged. But either way, it uh, Thorn uh, now knows about the regenerative abilities, and he plans whatever it takes to get his regenerative abilities off K9. Um, and uh, he uses this. Um, he uses the gladiator as a bomb. If K9 fires at it, it will release a massive explosion, killing K9. However, uh, to everybody's surprise, K9 refuses to fight. Despite his uh, grief over his the death of his friend, he will not fight. He does not want to harm another robot because they are logical creatures like himself. And in some way, he can relate. And in some ways, he can understand that robots are forced into these situations. Um, and he just does not fight. That is kind of a... I don't know about that. It feels really disingenuous because the story seems very prominent in him wanting to kill and then all of a sudden, not kill, but at least be in ready for the fight. Only for him to just be like, actually, no, I changed my mind. I'm peaceful, I'm peaceful, peace. Uh, do not harm me, I will not harm you. Kind of prerogative. It's really strange, it's really bizarre. Um, but Thorne has another plan. It turns out that the robot has a self-destruct system and K9 detects then the, uh, the dynamite within it. K9 uh, um, escapes just in time, but he reveals to Thorn um, that the explosion would still not be strong enough to even damage his circuitry. Um, and basically, um, Thorn is just like, I'm not here, because he doesn't want anything to do with Freddie Maxwell. But um, Georgie actually still has his um, illegal records. So Maxwell um, is, go is going to go down, uh, basically doing the department's job for them. And we then end the story on a somebody with our characters realising, it's like, how does Thorne know about the regenerative abilities? Now we've got to be extra careful because Thorne will be, uh, will stop at nothing to get K9. Um, and we also see Thorne talking to the leader of the department, um, which I think is, has been seen, he has been seen before. Uh, we, well, we see like the silhouette out through a door. Uh, Lomax, I believe the character is called. And it turns out that Thorne actually learned the regenerative abilities from this Lomax character and that um, he gets permission now to do whatever he wants to get K9's regenerative abilities, leaving his story on a semi cliffhanger. And that is uh, Robot Gladiator. Overall, it's, a, it's an okay story. It's not uh, dull, it's not uninteresting, it has a good visual difference to the rest of the story. It still might be a bit bland, it still might be generic. The robots are absolutely terrible. The clowns, are, anyway, specifically. Um, oh, I forgot to mention as well. Um, when we come to gladiator stories like this, you know, like Thor Ragnarok, Gladiator, um, and this, what you expect is big, bombastic action scenes. Seeing two people have nothing but the determination to kill one another. The fight, act, the action scenes in this are gone. Damn awful. They move so slow. It is akin to the uh, the Kirk, Captain Kirk fighting that lizard person in the original Star Trek series. It's that bad. Um, and that is a real... That really does drag the story down. But in a way, it is, it is an enjoyable watch. It is actually kind of... I wouldn't even put it so bad it's good. Some of the performances are over the top. Some of the leaps in logic are that leaps of logic. Um, but it's fun. It's entertaining. I personally enjoyed it. Um, it was something different, something unique uh, to the K9 canon. So I hope that this 
trend of K9 getting episodes like this keeps going. Uh, we, I think we've only got a handful of K9 episodes. So that would be um, interesting to watch uh, later down the marathon. But anyway, that's Robot Gladiator. So join me next time where the Doctor, Amy and Rory are stuck in a pocket universe as an entity that, um, um, that doesn't have a body of its own tries to get to our universe. And the Doctor finally gets to interact with the love of his life. So join me next time for The Doctor's Wife. And I'll see you next time on the Doctor Who Marathon. Ta-da!